Johnson walked away from frontline politics in December after 18 years as an MP, partly blaming what he described as the brutality and hostility within his own party. Leader. Well, as the race to select a new Labour leader gets underway, the former deputy leader joins us now. Good morning to you, Tom. How are you, Peace? By the way, the brutality and hostility is nothing to do with the interviews that you give me. That's, that's, that <laughs> well, was funny you should mention yes. that, because in yes. your book, yes. uh, great book, Tom Watson, Downsizing, How I Lost Eight Stone, Reversed My Diabetes and Regained My Health, uh, which actually would probably be more interesting to our, our viewers than almost anything else we talk about. Um, you say this, page 130, uh, about when you decided to come on to talk about this and you chose a number of places, including a prime time slot yourself on ITV's Good Morning Britain. I knew for a fact, you say, that many Westminster politicians disliked appearing <laughs> on GMB, fearing the programme's notoriously tough interviews. The combative <laughs> Piers Morgan, the forensic Susanna Reid were indeed a formidable duo. We I'd know. see many a guest shrink as they received a breakfast time grilling, but I'd always enjoy the experience. I like sparring with Piers and I admire Susanna's incisive line of questioning. Can I just yeah. say thank you? Yeah, because no, actually, you're going to kill me in this interview now. Yes. Well, <laughs> we'll try. But actually, what's interesting about it is uh, I, I actually think our viewers really respect people who do come on and run yes. the gauntlet a bit. Yeah. I, I, look, if you're a politician, you, you've got to put yourself through an interview like this. You've mm. got to talk to the nation, no matter how combative it is. And yet you? Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't. Well, he should have come on. I mean, what, what actually amazes me, uh, I mean, the idea that... It's, you don't see it as your public duty to do these yes, kind of I mean, totally no one likes agree. them. They are unpleasant. You have to get up early, you're on the back foot. Boris Johnson ran and hid in a fridge rather than talk to him yeah, before but the, the election. The thing is, I mean, literally Piers, ran to a fridge. But that didn't damage him. You see, the thing about Boris Johnson is people don't mind when he runs into a fridge because he'd rather be chilled than grilled. Yeah. But I wonder if it damages other politicians more. Well, I think in the long run, you, you've got to explain yourself. And... Mm. and Terrestrial TV is still the most powerful medium for explaining yourself. That's why people should do it. It's interesting that you say it. you've often seen people shrink as a result of these interviews because, actually, you did literally shrink <laughs> as did, a result yeah. of that interview that we did on Good Morning Britain because uh, you wrote a book, Downsizing. Uh, yeah. I'd suggested that you do... Let's just have a quick look. What happened during that interview? Some people say that if you just have a bulletproof coffee in the morning, you don't, you can, you know, skip your breakfast and, and go to lunch. And I sometimes do that. Are I... you bringing out a book by any chance? No, this all no. feels like Although, it's leading up to something. Oh, no, exactly. Oh, well, you know, I virtually could do that because it's so. Where's yes, wake you up probably could. Me. <laughs> Eight stone you lost, Tom Watson, yeah. and um, <laughs> lots of people trying to do that uh, as part of their New Year's resolutions. Uh, what was it that triggered such a massive weight loss? Have you put any back on? And how on earth do you do it? I gave up refined sugar, then I cut down on carbs, increased the fat intake, and that required me to break public health guidelines. Now, that's interesting, cos you upped your fat. I upped my and fat. And for decades, we have been told fat is the enemy. Yeah, I, I, well, I mean, balance is required, and I think that what I've... What I've learnt about myself and what I think thousands of other people who've done this have learnt is the time for one-size-fits-all nutritional advice from the government is over. People need bespoke advice. Their bodies are different. But you, you're tougher than that because you actually accuse food companies of selling us something which is toxic. Well, they certainly know that refined sugar does bad things to us and there are products out there, I won't name them, uh, where you can take more than your recommended daily allowance in a single can of pop. Uh, and to me, you know, when a third of kids are leaving school either overweight or obese, primary school, uh, and type 2 diabetes is now afflicting 3.4 million people in this country... We're eating too much sugar. We're eating Processed too much sugar. sugar. We're That's, eating too much and, sugar. And would you say that was the biggest... I think it's thing. absolutely the biggest. And yep. one of the things I say in the book, actually, is these new continuous glucose monitors that type 1 diabetics get prescribed. Theresa May had one. They wear it on their arm and you can see the sugar spikes from the food you eat. If my GP had given me one of those for a month when I presented as obese 20 years ago, I honestly think I'd have addressed my condition earlier. Right. So one of the things I want to do now that I'm a retired politician mm. is work with type 2 diabetes to try and campaign for changes in public Because you've reversed like your that. diabetes. Yeah, I reversed That's diabetes. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. Uh, yeah. um, you've also reversed your political career. Yes. You're out. Um, and that wasn't because you lost your seat. No, That it was, was because uh, you gave up. Yeah, because I gave up my seat. And then yeah. your seat to me, was lost, Yeah, wasn't it? It, it always seemed to me, Tom, yeah. that you losses. really weren't comfortable 
being deputy leader of a party led by Jeremy Corbyn. The, you might like him personally, but the, politically, this was uneasy bedfellows wrestling to try and work together, but it wasn't really working for you. Yeah, I tried to make it work. Um, I mean, I obviously... Look, I'm a pro-European social democrat. Uh, he, he's a, he comes from a different political tradition. That's not unusual that in two-party politics you have people with different sort of philosophical underpinnings. Uh, I think for me what was, what was a bit harder was I, I, I felt that we were... The sort of mechanisms of pluralism by which the way you resolve those differences institutionally was failing. So I wanted an elected shadow cabinet, for example, so we could have a sort of shadow cabinet that represent from members of all different wings of the party. I, I couldn't win that argument. But Corbyn, it seemed to me, he, he always seemed to me to be a serial protester. So when he was not the party leader, he used to protest all the time. He voted against his own government when Blair was uh, running the party 500 times or something. Uh, but when he actually got the real position of power, which was startling to many people, uh, not least in his own party, he seemed to struggle with what that meant. And when it came to the key question of Brexit, effectively, he sat on the fence so much, you could feel the splinters lacerating his torso. Um, was that, in the end, along with a, d a distrust of him, perhaps, but was the Brexit failure to be clear and failure to have a position, as Keir Starmer says, was it that that did for him in the end? I think that's a contributory factor. But, I, I mean, I think when Labour does the analysis, if it just boils it down to were we right on Brexit, it's a mistake. Uh, remember what was on offer in that manifesto. In two manifestos was a massive change to the political economy. Wholesale nationalisation, 1970s-style utilities being run by the state. Uh, the surprise announcement, I mean, it was my policy area and I didn't know it was coming out, on the broadband nationalisation. In the end, the electorate decided they didn't want to change their broadband provider. Uh, they were happy with what they had and, and they were... Well, actually, I think I, it was more they didn't believe the scale of the promises. They were getting, like, <laughs> £80 billion pounds worth of promises. And, and they then thought, suddenly there was a promise... deliver this. So you promised that you would cost everything, bring out the, the manifesto, a little grey book or whatever it was called, and then suddenly there's an extra promise for the waspy women. Yeah, well, it just uh, felt like Labour, did. again, was just <clears throat> offering so much and people didn't understand what the clear message was whether it would be funded or whether they could trust the leadership to deliver. I think, I, I think there's a, a truth in that argument, although I don't, think, um, I, I don't think huge spending pledges were unique to Labour in that election. I actually think all the political parties turned on the public spending tap. And that was a white noise that I think all voters found very difficult to discern. You say it wasn't all down to Brexit, but the fact that Boris Johnson just repeatedly hammered home, we're going to get Brexit done and that Labour red wall collapsed and people presumed that that was largely because mm. they believed that Boris Johnson was going to do what they had democratically chosen back in 2016 must be a massive part of the problem. It's part of it. It's always more complicated, though. Uh, that red wall, for example, I didn't really buy that theory. A lot of the seats that went last time were m the traditional marginal seats that Labour had won in the mid-90s and had slowly started to lose votes in from then on in. Uh, and, you know, not having a clear position on Brexit what was clearly a problem. OK, well, look, let's move to the future. The yep. future is going to be either Sir Keir Starmer, the first knighted leader of the Labour Party... Who is ahead in the polls currently. Or, it, or it's likely to be somebody like Jess Phillips or Rebecca long -Bailey. These are the front-runners at the moment. Yeah. What is your take on where this race is right now? It's early days, but... Um, well, I can only go on what the internal polls say, and it puts Keir Starmer ahead. I mean, f for me, though, I mean, I, I will urge all Labour members to reserve judgement until they hear what the candidates have got to say, particularly those that were on the front bench. That, they've got to explain why Labour keeps losing elections. Rebecca Long-Bailey hasn't yet declared officially that she's going to run. Uh, she is seen as the Corbynista inheritor. Yeah. Would she be a good leader or is she someone that you're saying should be held accountable and therefore would not? Well, like all... She was in the shadow cabinet. Yeah. Uh, so she, she was wedded to that manifesto. Uh, so she's part of the failure of the Labour Party? Well, she's got to explain why we lose elections. I mean, to explain whether she thinks we can win the next election and how she's going to do it. Um, but that's true of Keir and Emily as well, Emily Thornbury. Um, I mean, with, with um, Rebecca Long-Bailey in particular, I mean, she's obviously the sort of continuity 
mm. Corbyn candidate. And she, her decision, I guess, is does she sort of signal a break from that or does she try and defend that position? Who would you back? I don't know yet. I want to hear what they've got to say. Okay. Let me talk to you about something a lot more serious because it was a, it was a stain on your record, I would say, when you left. And it's this case involving this man, Carl Beach, yeah. jailed for 18 years over false claims of a Westminster abuse ring. He claimed he and others were tortured and raped, killed in some cases, by VIPs, uh, including former Home Secretary, Lord Britton, and the former military chief, Lord Bramall, former Conservative MP, Harvey Proctor, and others. You were at the centre of this. And in the uh, Henricks report, which came out by former High Court judge, Sir Richard Henricks, he said there can be no doubt that Tom Watson believed Nick, which was the name given to him. And it should be stated he previously provided the uh, police with information leading to convictions in other cases. His interest, however, in both this case and Operation Vincente has created further pressure upon officers. How guilty do you feel, if at all, put words in your mouth, about the fact that the reputations of Leon Britton, of Lord Bramall, of Harvey Proctor and others were really diabolically trashed yeah. mm -hmm. by a complete fantasist and hoaxer, and you were helping him. Well, I, um, on Cole Beach, I can only say what I've said before, Piers. Uh, I did get too close to the, the whole child abuse inquiry, the emotional sort of turmoil of the victims that came forward, and there were dozens of victims that came forward. Obviously, clouds your judgment. You've been there when you've reported on these things. But actually, on Carl Beach, and this is where I disagree with Henriquez, I, I, I'm on public record, and I said it very early on, that I wasn't, it wasn't my job to judge whether he, uh, he did it, whether what he was saying was true or not. In fact, I'm on public record as saying he's either an elaborate hoaxer or he's the real deal, he's not delusional. Uh, and it turns out he was an elaborate hoaxer. Uh, and a very cruel hoaxer because he's now going to You wouldn't have, Tom, with respect, you wouldn't have gone in the House of uh, Commons as you did and repeat some of the allegations that Leon Britton, one of the most evil just men... Said, I've never named Leon Britton okay. in the House of Commons. But the only time I mentioned Leon Britton, which wasn't underprivileged, mm. was after he died. But you called him evil. I, I, I repeated what... Yeah. Uh, Carl Beach told but you wouldn't me have done after that. he died, right, not but you, before. But you wouldn't... OK, but you, that's an, a clarification. But you wouldn't have said that if you didn't instinctively believe this guy. Well, there were... Uh, by the time I said that, the police had done a press conference and said they believed what he had to say. Which was in so, itself scandalous. Yes, but uh, so, so there I am, a politician. This guy presents himself and says he's a victim. Mm. The police asked me in all cases to reassure potential victims that they would be taken seriously and so it was my job to get him into the criminal taking, justice system. See, taking, this raises a really complex issue which is of course. we have in recent years and the Me Too thing, we've got Harvey Weinstein's case starts today and others, is that an allegation should, in my opinion, should be treated as an allegation. It shouldn't be treated uh, on presentation understood. as yeah. fact. Yeah. My truth as we've seen many times, sadly, is not necessarily the truth. Carl Beach's truth turned out to be a pack of lies. And lies, I, what I felt for, was Leon Britton's widow, who I think has still not accepted your apology, and mm. you say you respect that, but imagine how she must have felt that her husband, this man who served his country so well in Parliament, was basically described as evil by a senior politician, was accused of being part of a murderous paedophile ring. Lord Bramall, one of the most decorated, brilliant army men of our lifetime. Reputation trashed. Yeah, he's Harvey Proctor, another politician, trashed. He, he, won a load of, he won a lot of money, but there's no smoke without fire for many people, sadly. When you look back on this, Tom, you've had many successes in your career. Yeah. But when you look back on this, this was a stain, wasn't it? Well, look, what I'd say on Cole Beach, I, and I've said it, I, I feel very, very sorry that Beach existed and behaved like that. Mm -hmm. But in my defence, what I'll say is, a number of very serious, predatory, lifelong child abusers went to jail uh, for, uh, because of the evidence that was surfaced as a result of that inquiry. We've now got an independent ch inquiry into institutional child sexual abuse, where we've had uh, intelligence officers saying the Prime Minister of the day was told that her PPS was uh, mm -hmm. in, in some way compromised, where we found out that Cyril Smith, 
who was a, a, a minister, uh, admitted that he was a child abuser, was actually given a knighthood after he admitted it, uh, and was hiding out in public like other predators. But, but you, so so not, what I would say, what I would say is, yeah. it's not all about Carl Beach. Many serious paedophiles were jailed as a result of that. I get it. And we will get the, a, more, I, a better system. I get it. As a result of but the independent inquiry. That doesn't. Well, I know. You, well, you I might mean, get it, Pierce. But what, what I, you know, because there's been a, a sort of tabloid trashing over this one case. Well, hang on. Hang on. And it's and not tabloid trashing. People's reputation. Yes, I know. Tom, it's not tabloid trashing. I'm speaking on behalf of the family of Lord Bramall, of Leon Britton, of and Harvey I, Proctor and, and others. I'm very, very I can't so, and imagine. I'm very, very sorry to I them, can't imagine all a more I would despicable say is, thing to be said about would a say, member of your family when they were part of a murderous uh, paedophile. And, and I'm very sorry that that happened. I just ask people to give you know, a wider view of what good was done mm. as a result of that inquiry. Because at the end of the day, there are still thousands of... Uh, child abuse victims whose voice has not been heard. And their voice, system. yeah. But and and it impact? needs to be heard. And, and the Tom, balance I was trying to strike yeah. was to make sure that they were represented Tom, in the system and in studios like the point, this, though, the when... so that former tabloid editors can't just file a single fact on a very complex note yeah, well, it, and make it look, look like the whole child abuse being being a former tabloid, tabloid no, editor. No, but, you know, you're very good at it. But no, what I... But no, the point, the point, with that, The point I make... My argument with all these cases has been, of course, we know there are victims but they shouldn't be automatically believed as victims until we've had a chance to investigate. I think that's a fair point. And the point. problem with Carl Beach was everyone bought into him. The police Including described the him police. as a victim yeah. yes. before any evidence had been established yes. to prove that he was a victim. Well, you're right And my to thing say is, that. these are accusers, and if you treat them as victims the moment they appear with their stories, actually, in the end, when you have a fantasist like Carl Beach, it does a massive disservice to real victims. I don't they know. are the ones who yes. end up suffering. You would acknowledge and it's that. got nothing to me be being an ex-tabloid editor. Well, it's uh, to do with the reality of this terrible well, on story. That, I agree with you on that. I don't disagree with what you say on that. And I think that's the lesson, is that... I really... Cause I, I think you know, the police I really, swung the other direction I felt so Sabo. badly for the families of these three men, uh, in particular. I, I, Lord Bramall... You know, I mean, you wouldn't a get man. a greater yeah. military man in this country. Yeah. Mm. And there he was in the latter years of his life. Yeah. With his reputation... Uh, just just to say, I, I've never raised Lord Bramwell's name and Beach never mentioned Lord Bramwell mm. to me when I met him. Tom Watson, uh, good to see you. Uh, good, what are you going to do now? I'm training to be a level two gym instructor. You're training to so, be a personal trainer. Not quite that level yet, but uh, level two is before personal trainer. Come, come down the gym, Piers. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, give you a workout. I may do that. Uh, good to see you, Tom <laughs> You'd have to give up sugar as well. Do you want to do that? Uh, no, I don't. No, I, don't. I want to eat more sugar, more burgers, and uh, drink more alcohol. <laughs> That's why you get a body like this.